So today we are so blessed. We are so blessed because we have our dear brother. He's been with us since day one. And um, it's been a blessing to all of us. And I'm sure uh, to, to all of you, he's been a blessing, especially to the Exalt team. So he's our ministry head uh, for the Exalt team. And let's all welcome Brother Jay Singson. Thank you, Brother Matt, for that wonderful introduction. Let me just pop in some liquid here. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Good morning to everyone, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Today is what? Today is Sunday. It's the first Sunday of December. And you know what that means? It's the last month of 2022. And it's that time of the year again. Are you excited? As Matt uh, said it a while ago. How many of you have uh, started decorating your homes with Christmas decorations? Wala pa? How many of you have started decorating your homes since September or October of this year? Ah. How many of you did not take off those decorations since last year? Nandun pa rin siya, di ba? Have you seen Orchard Road lately, these past few days? Yun. Parang ayaw lumabas, ha? Orchard Road. Okay, let me just fix this. Can you move it, please? Yeah. So yeah, that's Orchard Road. Ganda ng lighting displays even now. Um, it, it signals Christmas here in Singapore, right? I still remember the time back in the Philippines, uh, way, way back in the Philippines, uh, you know it's Christmas, you know that Christmas has arrived when they start unveiling the, the animated displays in COD. Who among you are from Quezon City here? You remember that? When they, when they bring up the animated displays in COD, they still do that today. I only took a picture of uh, the one in uh, 2018. I still remember that uh, very exciting moment to, to have to see those things. The sights and sounds of Christmas they really have become an annual tradition all over the world. And it is truly the same time and time again. As my dear friend Michael Bublé says, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, right? Amen? Well, even here in my workplace, here in Santec, uh, where I know of only a few of us are Christians, the Christmas spirit is all around. <laughs> the smiles and the holiday cheer are now filling up our office as we march on towards year-end. Okay? Christmas now has transformed into a global celebration, no matter what religion, no matter what faith you belong to, right? There's something about Christmas that's so appealing and so, and so infectious to people of all race, of all creed, of all culture. Don't you agree? Maybe it's because most of us are going to get, what? We're going to get paid two times this month. 13th month is coming along. Okay, who's gonna get 13th month pay? Raise your hands. Yes, even partial, you'll get that. Who among you won't receive 13 month pay? Dame, diba? So you know who to go to this month, huh? Okay? For other people, they're looking forward to the year end gatherings. You know, those company year end dinners or luncheons, seeing colleagues and bosses, dining and laughing with them. You know, after a year long struggle and conflict with them, you get together at a year end uh, party. So have you experienced yung, you know, uh, your boss will, will come over to you during those parties and they will tell you, you know, we've had our ups and downs this year, so be prepared to do it all over again next year. <laughs> okay, a lot of us are expectant of the gift giving and of the reunions with friends and family members, the chance of flying back home to the Philippines or to whatever home country you belong to. But you know what? Lost in all this kind of revelry is the real story of Christmas. People have all sorts of ideas of what Christmas is now. Okay? And we all know what the Christmas story is all about, right? But somehow, even for us Christians, even for us Christians, there's a tendency to let this true message be muted. Because we are all somehow caught up with how the world celebrates Christmas. Okay? That is quite sad, you know. The genuine message of Christmas gets lost somehow year after year after year. Okay? 
Now, before you even think that I will be delivering a Christmas message this morning, let me stop you there. We are still right very much in the middle of 1 Peter, our study in the book of 1 Peter. But what does my intro have to do with our theme here of suffering for Christ for a future glory? Shouldn't we be all happy and joyful and content and medio uh, relax at this time of the year? Diba? Shouldn't our days be merry and bright and all our Christmases be white? <laughs> as, the song, as the song goes. Well, if we are to be true to the spirit of the season, we should always celebrate the man who is in the center of this event. And that man is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the way, is also our God, right? The Apostle Peter talks about this man in great detail here in 1 Peter. He even places a great deal of emphasis about his second coming. He's coming back again. He tells us many times in that episode. So I want to you know, tie this occasion, this first coming, Christmas celebrations that we have with our study on 1 Peter beginning now. Because we are, as we celebrate his first coming, which is Christmas, and remember and anticipate the second coming, we are in between that period, right? We are right smack into the center of that period. And in between that is where we are, and the Apostle Peter encourages us to focus on the kind of life we ought to live while we are in that period. Okay? Okay? So while we are in the middle of those two events, he wants to focus on the kind of life that we will be living. You see, what we are about to discover today is it's countercultural. It's not something that the world around us expects. I'm going to tell you today how to be truly blessed. I want to tell you how God can bless your life through these texts that we will study later on. I want to tell all of you how we can have a good and wonderful life. Who wants a good and wonderful life? Raise your hands. Every one of us, right? Although there will be bumps, there will be difficulties along the way, but this is the kind of life that a follower of Jesus is supposed to have. I want all of us also to receive this instruction with gladness and with willingness. Although it's going to be very hard for us to accept it, we should be able to apply all of these things as soon as we can. Okay? It's good to learn and apply these things now so that when the testing comes, when suffering and trials comes, we won't be surprised. Okay? 1 Peter 4, 12-13 says there, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in His suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing the glory when it is revealed in all the world. That is what I believe the Apostle Peter has intended for all of us recipients of this letter. And the title of this message today is called The Good Life and How to Live It. The Good Life and How to Live It. But before I even give you a short recap of where we are right now in our First Peter study, let's all bow down our heads and let's pray to our Lord God. Father, we thank you that we can come together as the body of Christ and, and open up our hearts to you and, and to your word that you would speak to us, Lord, and bring wisdom and understanding to our hearts. But Lord, even more so that we might take the word, this word that you will be giving to us and apply it as we go out from this place to walk it out, to live it out, Lord God, in our daily lives. And for that, Lord, we need your all-important strength, your grace, and the mighty courage that only comes from you. We thank you, Lord, because you are forever faithful in all our lives. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, so last Sunday, Brother Julius capped the verses, you know, he finished the verses that the apostle wrote with regards to, what, submission. Remember that? We were given specific instructions on how we should behave and interact in the three areas of our relationships. What are those? Our relationships in our society as we submit to authorities, our relationship with our employers, our managers, our masters. And then our relationships inside our homes as we submit to our spouses. Okay? Now, the word that stood out in those three exhortations is the word submission. How many of you have applied that in your lives since we have been 
talking about it Sunday after Sunday. And Brother Julius wonderfully pointed out that to submit is not something you force yourself into doing. Okay? Because if fear or intimidation, but, but because it is a God-given role, it's a God-given assignment to all of us. Submission is a decision to yield to someone else and to put their interests ahead of our own because this is a God-given role to all of us. Now, of course, if we were in a situation that is ideal, right? Madali siyang i-apply. Okay? Very easy to apply if the environment, if the surroundings, if the people around us are friendly. It's very easy to apply. I, I wouldn't use the word easy. Probably we, are, we would be willing to submit to these people, right? But you know, like the first century Christians to whom this letter was written to, they were living in an environment that is also less than ideal. Brother Julius even mentioned that a lot of them were facing death and torture, even, even worse conditions than we are living in right now. Okay, Although sometimes when you are with a difficult boss or a colleague, di ba, parang death and torture na rin yung, <laughs> yung experience. You know, the conditions will never be ideal while we are here on this earth. That's our sad reality. Sin has marred the good world that God created. But through Jesus Christ, we are given a new hope of the life ahead, a victorious and abundant life ahead of us, as He promised. Remember that. And while we wait for the end of this life and the beginning of what we hope for, the Apostle Peter gives us things that we can enjoy and apply even now. Firstly, he never gave them a choice of transferring to a secluded place, you know, to a secluded island far away from the Roman Empire where they can live in peace, they can live in harmony with each other, away from oppression, away from danger. What he told them is to sum up this whole idea of being submissive is to remain where you are, okay? And to behave what? To behave differently. That's our responsibility, brothers and sisters to be different, to be a different kind of people. That's why, you know, believers of the Lord Jesus Christ were called saints in the New Testament because they were set apart for our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the same with us. We are to live differently in this world because of and before for Jesus Christ. Okay? John 15, 19, it says there, If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, tayo but I chose you out of the world. Because of this, the world hates you. So what do I mean by that? If you are a, you know, if you are a genuine believer in Jesus, you will never have a perfect, you will never have a perfect, comfortable, ideal life here on earth. Because the whole world is against what we stand for. Okay? I would even put it this way: the world and the world system is offended by what Jesus Christ offers and what Jesus Christ has to say. Right? But in retrospect, I want to tell you how to really have a good life, a happy life, a happy uh, a life of purpose. That is why we should expect trouble. We should expect persecution. And while we anticipate the coming of these things, we prepare ourselves for it, even now as we celebrate Christmas. Okay? So let's continue on with five verses the Apostle Peter wrote concerning this matter. Shall we all stand to honor uh, this gospel? Or this word from 1 Peter 3, 8 to 12. Okay, all of us, let's read this. To sum up, all of you, be harmonious, sympathetic, loving, compassionate, and humble, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you would inherit a blessing. For the one who desires life, to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against evildoers. You may sit down now, please. May God bless everyone who has read and has heard the reading of his word today. Now, what have we just read? Peter says, what? Be harmonious, be sympathetic, loving, compassionate, and humble. You know, does that mean that I have to be those things to my managers, to my bosses, to my 
roommates who, uh, who do not believe in Jesus Christ? Am I supposed to be like that? Does Peter mean to say we should all be like this? You know, it's, gonna, it's very hard, right? Now, there are three things that the Apostle Peter tells us to do in order for us to experience the good life. First, we have to cultivate the right heart attitudes. Okay? Cultivate the right heart attitudes. Next, we are to cultivate the right attitude towards hostility. When we are attacked, what should we do? When we are abused verbally, what should we do? And lastly, we should cultivate a hunger for God's blessing. So the first one, how to cultivate the right heart attitudes. And it starts there in verse 8. It says there, to sum up all of you, again, be harmonious, sympathetic, loving, compassionate, and humble. First of all, the Apostle Peter writes to sum up, or in other versions, it says there, finally. You can find it in your scripture. He says, finally, and he was speaking to whom? He was speaking to, he says, to all of you, right? To all of them who are part of the church, the believers who are scattered all over the place. And he's talking to us as well. He's writing to church members, people who belong to the body of Christ. And this, he says, is how we treat one another in the spiritual family. To be harmonious, be sympathetic, be loving, be tender-hearted, be compassionate, and be humble. Now, when he writes finally here, when he writes that, he doesn't mean that he's about to end this whole letter. He's just concluding his previous exhortation that began in 1 Peter 2, verse 12, where he says there, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Peter puts together a list of five heart attitudes that must describe each and every one of us so that we all model what Peter wants for us to become. He gives us now practical advice on how we conduct ourselves with other members of the church body and as well as strong instructions as we relate to the people around us. A hostile world, he says. That is why when we live as different kind of people, our witness of our Lord Jesus Christ becomes very important, right? It is not only the things that we say about Jesus that will mean, it is also the lives that we show about Jesus to people from within this church and from outside this church that is important as well. Do you agree that? Amen. Now, what are again these heart attitudes that we should exhibit to one another? I'm repeating it again and again so that we don't forget. Be harmonious, sympathetic, loving, compassionate, and humble. Okay, before I explain one by one what these uh, attributes or qualities or attitudes are, let me invite you to take an online poll with me, okay? Bring out your phones and then scan the QR code here. These are, uh, and the question is there, how would you rate this church, CCF Singapore, with the following virtues found in 1 Peter 3.8, Okay? Shall we do that? Now, if you scan this code, you will, it will take you to the link with that question, and then you will find one space there. Okay? When you click on that link, on that space, you will find all those five virtues. Be harmonious, be sympathetic, be uh, loving, all those things. Select the first one, but don't press submit yet. Select the first one. That will be your top answer, right? Then the next one will be your second, then third, fourth, and then the last one. Then you press submit. Shall we do that? I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Wag yung masyadong pag-isipan. The very first impression that you have of this church, okay? It doesn't matter if you have been here for the very first time. You will have an impression of what, who we are. And that is very important for us to know, okay? Shall we do that? I'll give everyone a chance to do that. Can we run up the... How many of you have scanned the QR code already? Okay. How many of you is having trouble scanning this? Okay, we can probably flash the results. Wow. Out of 79, 82, 86 respondents, unang-una yung loving. Okay, ah. 
Number two is compassionate. Number three is humble. Fourth is harmonious. And fifth is sympathetic. Very interesting, right, Matt? Ah, umangat na yung harmonious. <laughs> this is very good, actually. Very interesting results. And I guess we really need to probably work on how to become sympathetic. No? <laughs> how to really sympathize with our, our members. Thank you so much for uh, answering this. <laughs> good thing daw, sabi ni Matt, humble is not number one. <laughs> Now, there was a survey conducted recently, only last year in the U.S. Over 3,000 Americans aged 18 and above were invited to participate in a survey conducted by Ipsos for the Episcopal Church in the U.S. They were trying to find out how Christians and non-Christians view Christians today. Can we switch now? Okay. You know what came out of that poll? For Christians, they said that they describe themselves as being giving, 57%. Being compassionate, 56%. Being loving, 55%. Respectful, 50%. Taas, no? And friendly, 49%. You know what non-Christians have to say about Christians in this poll? They say, Christians are hypocrites, 50%. What else? Oh, yun lang. No, there's more. Being judgmental, 49%. That stood out to them. Self-righteous, 46%. And then, lastly, being arrogant. Being proud, that's 32%. And so there was a disconnect between the way in which Christians view themselves, right? And the way non-Christians view Christians as well in that study. The one who did the survey said... They said this, this is a wake-up call for all of us. And based on what we have learned, we are refocusing our efforts on being a church that looks and acts like Jesus and models its behavior on His teachings. In this process, we hope to ignite a revival of love that encourages all Americans to do a better job of loving their neighbor. Ignite a revival of love. You know, love. Actually, love is the word that encompasses these five attitudes, right? If you don't have love for your brethren, they won't see that we are changed people. Now, verse 8 begins with, let us all be, oops, nasobrahan. Let us all be harmonious. Yeah. Be harmonious. Okay. In other versions, the word used is being like-minded or having the same mind, having the same mind. The unity of the mind. In your D groups, can you say that you have unity of the mind? Can you say that among your D groups? Now, what does that mean? Does it mean we are always singing the same tune? We are always finishing each other's sentences? <laughs> Harmony is like making beautiful music together, right? Different parts joined together. And you hear beautiful sound, beautiful music, right? Well, let me begin by telling you what it is not. Having unity of mind or being harmonious does not mean uniformity. It doesn't mean conformity. It does not mean we all think alike. It does not mean we all act alike. It does not mean we all dress alike. Although some people, I think, they, they would want to dress alike every Sunday. Because we will always have what? We will always have differences no matter what. Do you agree? Some of you don't agree, so tignan nyo, we have differences. Conformity is a feature of many cults, okay? In a cult, everyone thinks the same thing. Whatever the cult leader teaches, the members strictly adhere to and fight for the same thing. It also means that if you don't believe or act and think the same way, high chance you will be kicked out of that group, okay? Our church's harmony should attract, you know, the world around us. It should be a distinct feature among us that will make them think, what are these Christians? Why are these Christians so united? What binds us together? What makes us so united? Even though we have a lot of differences. Warren Wearsby says, being harmonious means cooperation. 
cooperation in the midst of diversity. The members of the body work together in unity, even though they are all different. Christians may differ on how things are to be done, but they must agree on what is to be done and why it needs to be done. Okay? And this is not a new instruction from the Apostle Peter. A lot of the New Testament writers have also written about having the same mind. You see, Romans 12, 16 says there, from Paul, be of the same mind. From Philippians chapter 2, it says, Paul says, make my joy complete by being what? Of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Okay? A phrase that is so appropriate in this context is what? In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, what? Liberty. In all things, love. Unity in diversity. Diversity in unity. We have that here in our church. The opposite of being harmonious is what? The opposite is being contentious, being quarrelsome. Lagi na lang kumokontra. Every Sunday, kontra. <laughs> The Christian should seek to be harmonious in his relationships with everyone. But in our church, this should be one of the most outstanding quality that is to be found among our brothers and sisters. You know, the best example of this that I can think of right now is your core leadership here in this church, our core, loop, our core group. My intention is not to brag about how good this group are or is, which is, by the way, I'm a part of, but I want to tell you one unique feature of this group. Here we are. No? We, we are a group of six couples with different backgrounds, personalities, different number of years residing in this planet, um, different experiences, different learnings. But I tell you, when we have our meetings you know, to discuss church, church matters, and how we can lead and how we can best serve the church or the congregation, it takes a long time to finish these meetings. I think evidence. Oh. Next. Yeah. 8.15 p.m. Patapos pa lang kumain. Just finishing dinner. And then we will need to talk again to finish the meeting off. Then this meeting, which happened recently, started at 3 p.m. Okay. Now, I don't mean it in a negative way, okay? I always thought to myself, why does, why does our meetings go on so very long? And, and this is it, because each of us, despite our differences and convictions, pursue being harmonious, being united, being like-minded as much as we can, because it's not going to be an automatic thing. We need to uh, cultivate that among our group. We realize that people given to us by God in our care and the responsibilities given to us are precious to God. That is why we do not mind staying longer until we come to the best decision for everyone in this church. And also a lot of times when there are disagreements within the group, you know, the way it is communicated among us is with grace, respect, and love. Brothers and sisters putting themselves in the place of the other person. And I'm not saying that we are you know, a perfect team, but it really helps to know when to put aside personal preferences and personal opinions in favor of the greater good. And so studying this passage about harmony makes me appreciate these things that we have. And I praise God for that. You get what I'm saying? We all have different stations in life. We all have different gifts, different ministries. Right? We have different um, lenience, leanings. But we all have embraced one true gospel, one same gospel. We have embraced the essentials of the truth. And this is, here is where there shouldn't be any division, what we believe in. Trusting in the same Savior and following His leadership through His Word and by His Spirit. Okay? Did you get that, brothers and sisters? Now, with this first heart attitude, let's all ask ourselves this. Are you open to God showing you whether your attitude or action contributes to or detracts from the harmony in your church, in your family, in your marriage, in your D-groups, and in your workplace? So ask yourself that question, okay? So our next heart attitude is what? Let us all be sympathetic. Sympathetic. Now, what do, what do you guys know about sympathy? What is that? 
What is sympathy in Tagalog? Simpatsya. Ati Tagalog lang. Ano? Another word that I can think of is pakikiramay. But it's not a totally direct translation of sympathy that we have here in the Bible. Is it just feeling sorry for the sad situation of your brother or your sister? Is it when you hear of a terrible news from them, your reaction is just to send a message, sorry to hear that, bro, sis, we'll pray for you. <laughs> well, nothing wrong with that kind of a response, but is that all there is about sympathy that the Apostle Peter is speaking about here? You know, the word sympathetic is a, is a combination of two words. It's a compound word made up from the root word suffer and the prefix with. Its original meaning is to suffer with, to feel with. We are to identify and empathize with others in bad times as well as in good times, in their sorrows as well as in their joys. Romans 12.13 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Right? 1 Corinthians 12.26 What does it say there? Kailangan ko extend yung arm. Yun. If one part of the body suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If a part is honored, all the parts rejoice with it. Now for us, the best, to best practice this, there is a need to sense the feelings and experiences of others. You, you, know, you know, maging sensitive to their concern. Okay? And how does that happen? How do you think Things like that would happen when you spend, what, more and more time with your brothers and sisters, right? Do you agree? A lot of times, a lot of times I fail in this. I get myself so busy with, with ministry work, especially on a Sunday and with the preparations that I fail to ask the next person I'm around with, how are you? I fail to ask the person I'm doing ministry with, Kumusta ka na? How are you? Why are you? Why are you here? What are you struggling with? How can I help? How can I pray for you? That should be our attitude one with another. And I know sometimes you encounter a person who, who seems to be always down. Have you encountered a person like that? A person who's always down. You ask him, oh bro, how are you? Kumusta ka na? And they will say, okay lang ako, I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling, but I'm okay, I'm okay. Then you meet them next Sunday, and then you're happy, you're, you want to talk to them again. You say, how are you, bro? I'm okay. I'm still struggling, but I'm okay. Have you met anyone like that? You know, then after five months, ganun pa rin, no? I'm okay. Struggling, pero I'm okay. You know, after a while, you don't want to look for that person anymore, di ba? You, when you see him, you, you avoid him na lang, di ba? You know, people call it the Eeyore syndrome. How many of you have known this character? Eeyore. He's Winnie the Pooh's friend who's always, what? Pessimistic, who's always gloomy, right? Parang the world will crash any moment now. It's that character. But you know what? Jesus will continue to pursue that person, right? Jesus will continue to love that person no matter what. I know it's hard and sometimes it's taxing. Mahirap, di ba? You need to go out of your comfort zone just to reach out to this person. But that is true sympathy. Amen? True sympathy continues to pursue a person even though sometimes they are content in their seemingly miserable lives. We are to provide a breath of fresh air to a person who is really going through something like that. You know, what, what's happening now? Standard Chartered Marathon, right? What's the, what's the favorite thing that each and every marathon or runner wants to achieve or wants to look for? It's not the finish line. It's those water stations, right? Every uh, maybe 100 meters or so, you'll find a water station. Then, oh, now who's no? They want to, to drink. The church should also be like that. We provide refreshment for people. Amen? We should be like that. Reach out to that person one more time for Jesus Christ, is what I want to say. So we need to be genuinely concerned with our fellow brother or sister. We need to be more sensitive with what is going on around them. Okay? We need to step outside our comfort zones so that we can identify with their pains, with their sorrows, with whatever they're going through. The opposite of that heart attitude of being sympathetic is what? Being detached, being self-centered. I'll just stay in that corner, prepare my speech. 
and let you do your own thing. William Barclay said, as long as self is the most important thing in the world, there can be no sympathy. Okay? Sympathy depends on the willingness to forget self. It is only when we die to self that we can live for others, right? Ask yourself this question, am I willing to go out of my comfort zone to really get to know and care for my fellow brother and my fellow sister? Okay. So the next heart attitude that we need to cultivate is this. Let us all be loving. Love the brethren, it says there in other versions. Be harmonious, sympathetic. We are to love and to love with a brotherly kind of love. To love with a brotherly kind of love. That's where we get our word Philadelphia or Philadelphos. Be brethren who are loving. It's the Greek word for phileo. You know this word? And it means to love as brothers, to love as brothers. We don't view ourselves as strangers. We view ourselves as members of the spiritual family, as brothers and sisters. Now, it's not easy to love our brothers, right? Is it easy? Not easy, right? I grew up with four siblings, two older sisters and two younger brothers. And in my experience, I'm more close to my two older sisters. I talk to them more. I share stories with them more. I communicate with them more. Uh, emotionally, I'm more attached with them. Uh, I didn't play dolls with them, but I spent more time with them. My brothers, just separate kami. We had our separate ways because we had our separate um, likes and dislikes. So I didn't get to experience that. We all went our separate ways, my brothers. And I guess some of you, your best memory of your brother or your brothers was when they hit you with something. Diba? May mga So how can I love my brother, right? I love my brother as they have treated me the same way. But we are to love our brothers. We are to love the brethren as family. Because what? Because we are all children of God. We are all children of God. We belong to the spiritual family in our Lord Jesus with God being our heavenly Father. Okay? 1 Peter 1, 22. He alluded to this. He said, Since you have purified your souls in obedience to the truth for a sincere love of the brothers and sisters, what? Fervently love one another from the heart. Phileo love is a love that any unsaved man can produce to some degree. And if an unsaved person can produce it, how much more we Christians who have the Spirit in us can produce this? This is the kind of love that shows respect, that shows courtesy, appreciation, and a deeper affection with the members of our church family. You know, this, this attribute, this quality, should be strongly held together with the second and fourth attribute later on. Sympathy and compassion. You won't be able to love without sympathy, without compassion. Okay? The opposite of this is simply what? Hating your brother or your sister. Or maybe being unconcerned with them. Wala kang pake. I don't, you have your own way, I will have mine. Okay, and then ask ourselves this question. In what ways do you show love to your family? Do you actively do you actively seek the welfare of your brother and your sister in Christ? The fourth attitude, the fourth heart attitude we need to cultivate is this. Compassionate. Be compassionate. Let us all be compassionate. In other versions it says what? Be kind-hearted or be tender-hearted. Tender-hearted. It sounds similar to the second attribute, right? It sounds similar to being sympathetic. But if being sympathetic refers to our commitment to know how others are doing, being compassionate or being kind-hearted refers to our emotional response to what they are going through. The original Greek word used here is eusplanknos. Ah, eusplanknos, having strong bowels, strong intestines. Labo, no? Because in those days, people believed that the strong, intense, and deep emotions come from this part of the body here. Kaya ang laki ng bowels ko, eh, no? I feel deep emotions here. In our gut. That's why you hear the phrase, what? I feel it in my gut. 
I have this feeling in my gut. Uh, you also have heard of the phrase, oh, I have butterflies. Diba? I have butterflies in my stomach. You feel it here. It's the same thing. Peter uses the term to refer to the depth of concern or the depth of compassion we should have toward others. How many of you have met someone who is always there for you when you're down, when you're struggling? Diba? How many of you have those persons, those friends of yours who would often call you and know how you are? Diba? He or she would, would even send you food even though you know that they know that you, you don't have any appetite to eat. They will still send you food because they know that you need it. This person would come over, spend the whole day with you, listening, crying with you, and just being there even when they are just sitting there for the whole day. Huh? This person is committed and is committed to pray for you. Now that is compassion. That is how tender-hearted is. A person being moved to act on what he or she sees and senses. So if all of a sudden you feel you know you feel something here, you feel something here, hindi yan always stomach cramps, okay? Maybe it's the Lord telling you to approach this other person to speak to them or to talk to them. Now this characteristic is prominent in the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus. He was often found to be showing pity and sympathy, and he acted on this by helping them and telling them of the hope that they needed to have. Matthew 9 36, it says there, Seeing the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. And he acted on this by telling his disciples to pray to the Lord of the harvest, remember that? To send out the workers, the ones who will care for these people. So the opposite of this is being what? Uncaring, being aloof, being distant to the needs of the other person. Then ask yourself this question. In what ways can I grow to be affectionately sensitive, to be quick to feel and show compassion to my brother or to my sister? Ask yourself that question. Finally, and the last heart attitude we need to learn is this. Let all be what? Humble. In some versions, it says, let all be humble in spirit. Humble in spirit. How many of you, how many of you here are humble? You, they say if you raise your hands, you stop being one. <laughs> That's the moment you stop being one. Now, being humble in spirit or humility is one long topic on its own. We have had a lot of discussions, a lot of sermons about this topic. And that is good because we all need to be reminded every time to learn about this subject because it's easy to lose it, right? It's easy to be proud, to be arrogant, and I think the reason why Peter included this among the heart attitudes that we need to cultivate is that being humble in spirit is needed so that you can be harmonious. You can live in harmony with your brothers and sisters. I think he used this, he included this so that you can be able to submit to the authorities, to your employers, and even to your spouse. Humility. And we all would say, I know my rights and I will push my rights especially when I am correct. But this should not always be for all of us Christians, okay? You know, the perfect model of humility or being humble-minded is the Lord Jesus Himself. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. This is Jesus being found in appearance as a man. He humbled Himself by becoming, what? Obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. That is a true testament of Christian humility. Jesus the all-powerful God submitting Himself with all humility for our benefit. Okay, Even now, I'm amazed at how He has done that for all of us. And now Peter challenges us to be the same. Even the Apostle Paul agrees and challenges us to be the same as well. In Romans 12, 16, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. What does haughty mean? It means conceited or self-important or exclusive but associate with humble people, those with a realistic self-view. Do not overestimate yourself. Do not have a high estimation of yourself because you came into this world with nothing. Amen? It is only by the grace and mercy of God that we are alive today. It is because of His blessing, the blessing of God, that we are all here in this room today. So how do we become truly humble? How do we become truly humble? 
you just walk into the room and just be like that. No, that's not true humility. How to become truly humble? It's by taking a long and hard look at the Lord Jesus Christ. Consider what He has gone through. Consider how He came into the world as a baby in the most lowly manner. We will be celebrating this. Consider the opportunities wherein He could have displayed His awesome power to those who abused Him, but He chose not to. Remember that. He did all these things to honor His Father and because He loves all of us. And so the sooner we turn away from ourselves and we look at the Savior, we realize that God is the one that gives all things and that will truly humble all of us. Okay? Now, the opposite of humility is what? Being proud. Being arrogant. And we need to ask this question amongst ourselves. What changes do you need to make in your attitude to cultivate humility in your life. Okay? So here we have is the first step into this awesome life, this good life that Peter is telling us about. Okay? To develop or to cultivate the right heart attitudes by being harmonious, being sympathetic, loving as brothers, being compassionate, and being humble. Now he says it's not enough that we should only focus on the right attitudes towards our brothers and sisters. Okay? The Apostle Peter takes it up one level higher. He says in verse 9, Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you would inherit a blessing. And the second point in order to live a good life is this. We need to cultivate the right attitude towards hostility. Okay. How many of you here have been mistreated, have been verbally abused, have been insulted. Raise your hands. Wala. Si Joy yun, taas ng kamay. <laughs> ano yung, what's, what's the uh, modern way of doing this right now? It's cyberbullying, right? How many of you have experienced that? How many of you are going through something like this right now? This one's for you. How many of you have been attacked because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Bless you, sister. Listen up as the Apostle Peter gives us life-changing advice on how to respond to these kinds of hostility. But to give you a bit of context, during this time in the first century church, when this letter was written to, it was common for people to be maltreated. It was common for them to be attacked verbally, especially if they didn't hold a high position in the Roman society. They lived in a very cruel world, and it was common for them to receive you know, harsh verbal treatment, especially Christians and Jews. Today, especially here in Singapore, it's highly likely that this won't happen to you, right? And, and it's because we have institutions right now in place within the government wherein you can report such kind of abuses. We live in a society where the laws protect us from harassment and from abuse. Be aware of that, my friends. But even if it does happen, to a certain degree, the Apostle Peter gives us sound advice in response to these hostile persons. We cannot control what's going to happen around us, right? But we can be responsible for how we react or how we respond to them. He says there are two things that we can do in a situation like this. Number one, I think this is very easy for us Christians. He says, do not return evil for evil or insult for insult. And in some versions, it says, do not return reviling for reviling. What does that mean? It means we don't retaliate in the same way, right? We don't act in the same way. But look at number two, the number two advice. It says, give a blessing instead. But give a blessing instead. Or in other versions, it says, return good for evil. Meaning when your whole body is telling you to fight back, you know, I sigawan ko na to. <laughs> I want to talk back to him. You do not fight fire with fire, but instead, what does he say? Give a blessing instead. Or do something good to them in return. This is really countercultural. It's, e- it's easy to teach, but it's very hard to do and to practice. And you know why we need to do this? It's because, read the complete verse. It's because he says, We were called for the very purpose that you would inherit a blessing. 
this one is also a God-given role to all of us. God has ordained for us to approach situations like this in this way. So when you hear about something like this, you say, really, Peter? You expect me to do nothing if someone treats me like this? On the contrary, we are to do something, right? And what is that? It says right there, we are to give a blessing instead. You know, the, sec- the first advice, I think to most of us, as we have learned it, it's very easy to do. But the second advice, it's very hard to accomplish, right? Why? Because would I treat that person good when that person does not like me? Diba? I- I'd rather withhold my blessing. <laughs> I'd rather not pray for that person, especially if I'm really being abused day in and day out. Our natural reaction is to flee from the scene, get away as far from that person as possible, right? But he says we are to, what, respond differently to offenses like this. Give a blessing instead. Now, how do we bless them? How do we bless them? If you're being attacked verbally, someone shouting at you, do you say, oh, may God bless you, my child? Do you say it like that, did ba? If you do that, Of course, we need to pray for them. And as much as we can, and as far as we are able to, we need to also win them for Jesus. Okay? Who will supply the grace and the strength to do that? It's Jesus Christ and His Spirit, right? When evil is done to us, we are to respond by doing good. We are to respond by giving blessing instead of evil against them. We are not to just keep our mouths shut. Okay, But we are to repay evil with good. And I say this as if I'm speaking to myself as well because it's very hard to do. My wife says, kill them with kindness. Have you heard that term? Kill them with kindness. Our Lord somehow taught this same principle. Bless those. What? Let's all read this. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. So really? Pray for them? You know, I would just as easily pray an imprecatory psalm on them. You know an imprecatory psalm? Those psalms that call on God to bring justice to His people, right? One psalm sounds like this. It says, May their eyes grow dim so that they cannot see. You want to pray like that? How about this? Psalm 58. Break the teeth in their mouths, O God. You want to pray like that? Very nice life verses, no? You want to memorize those in, when, you're, when you have an opponent, when someone's angry at you. Lord, break their teeth in their mouths. Grabe. But what we are to do, we are to return good for evil. It's as simple as that. Ba? We pray for them. We pray that God will change their hearts and pray that God will enable you to respond in this way. We have been called to inherit a blessing. If we are to live consistently with our calling, then we should be characterized by the fact that we bless other people instead of hating them, instead of going against them, even though they constantly hurt us. Good advice, my dear brothers. So let us all try to develop the right attitude towards hostility. Cultivate that. And what's the right attitude towards hostility? Don't retaliate in the same way and give a blessing instead. Amen? We try to do that. Now, verses 10 to 12 are direct quotations from Psalm 34. Peter borrows this word for word from the Psalm of David. This was during the time David was being pursued by King Saul. Okay, So it's the same. 10 to 12 are the same uh, passages that you will find in Psalm 34, verse 12 to 15. And so this was during the time David was being pursued by King Saul, who wanted him what? He wanted him dead. And David fled to their enemies. He fled to Gath to seek refuge. And he pretended to be what? He pretended to be insane among the people so that he could survive. And David writes this psalm during that tumultuous period for himself, And for all of us, as his prescription to a wonderful and blessed life. He says this is attainable in spite of this this troubling situation that he is in. He's able to write this. And what does it say? Let's all read this. For the one who desires life to love and see good days. Do you desire life and see good days? Yes. What does we do? 
must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. And verse 12, what does it say? For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against evildoers. In verses 10 to 11, Peter gives us three things we need to do to have this this kind of blessed life. First, control your tongue, right? Second, turn away from evil. Turn away from sin. And third is what? To do good. To seek peace and pursue peace. Take note at verse 10, he says, we are to keep our tongues from speaking evil and also from speaking deceit. Have you ever gotten yourself into trouble because of the things that you say? Who among you have, <laughs> have recently done that? I like how one of our pastors in Manila, he says that when they have a problem like this with his wife, when they argue because their tongues are quicker than their minds, what they want to say, he says after the argument, they will pause and they will rework their words. Nice advice, right? They will rework their words so that it comes out in a more positive and a more edifying way. Nice advice. You know, our tongue is one of the most ferocious beasts on earth because it is hard to control. James chapter 3, verse 8 to 10, it says there, But no one among mankind can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people. We have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come forth blessing and cursing. The Bible also says in James 6.45, For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So when you say something nasty and you tell yourself, where did that come from? It comes from where? It comes from your heart, right? So allow the Spirit of God to change your heart. And when your heart is changed, then your vocabulary also changes, right? Words of kindness, words of love, encouragement, edification, words like this come out instead of evil words. Secondly, turn away from sin. It literally says there in verse 11, turn away from evil. The word means to avoid evil. We must hate sin, the thing that God hates. So the first two things is to guard your speech and to guard the way we live. Okay? And the third, the third step also in verse 11, which is the positive action, is to do good and to seek and pursue peace. Matthew 5 verse 9 says there, Blessed are the what? peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. We become peacemakers, not peace breakers. Okay? Now you may be thinking, wait a minute, Brother Jay, you've been talking about what? Submitting to another person, denying myself, laying down my rights, not retaliating, Blessing those who insult me. Being harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble. But if you knew, or if you know my husband, if you know my wife, or you know my boss, yung boss ko, salikod ko lang, or my roommate, you'd know that if I did that, I'd usually get trampled on. Diba? Am I supposed to be a doormat? If I did that at work, I'm going to be pushed around. I'm going to be a pushover. I need to assert myself. I need to, you know, protect myself. Who's going to look out for me? Who's going to protect me if I act like this all the days of my life? Now, verse 12 gives us comforting news about that. You see, God will protect us. For the eyes of the Lord are toward us, the righteous, if we do these things. His ears attend to our prayer. But the face of the Lord is against evildoers. His eyes are on the righteous. His ears attend to our prayers. You know, do you want God to be on your side? Amen? Then please turn to Him. Turn from evil and do good in your walk and in your words. Even if you suffer for the sake of God, you will receive a blessing. Cultivate a hunger for God's blessing. That's our third major point. If you allow yourself to turn away from evil and do good with your words and your actions, God's eyes are upon you. It says there in verse 12, God's eyes are upon you. His watch of eyes are on you. His providential care is on you. And I want this, you know, I want 
I want to know that God wants to take care of me. I want to know that God hears my prayer to answer my prayer. And that is there also. He ears, his ears attend to our prayer. God is so good to us that we should yearn for His continued, continual blessing in our lives until we get to heaven. And verse 12 also comes with a warning. He says there, If you do not seek or pursue this kind of good life, what does it say there? The face of the Lord is against evildoers. What that means is, you will face His judgment, you will face His wrath if you don't strive to become the very person that you want you to become. As we end, you're probably wondering if this is doable or not. Is this doable? You're still thinking through. <laughs> it's doable, yes? But it's very hard to do, right? It's very hard to, to do. It's very easy to preach, but it's very difficult to practice. Well, I would like to share with you a report that I got from the early Christian church, okay? From the early Christian church to prove to everyone that this is doable, this report came around the late 2nd century and early 3rd century. So, medyo inaalikabok na yung, yung, yung parchment na to, okay? And by this time, a lot of the apostles have probably been long gone, okay? But take note, more than 50 years after Jesus has gone away into heaven, what has happened to the Christian church? It has flourished, right? That's why we're here. And if you are a student of of church history, you know that during these times, Christians were still very much persecuted. Yeah? They were still treated very harshly. And so the Roman authorities wanted to, to quash this group. They wanted to destroy this group because they thought that they were becoming rebellious, troublesome, and, and disloyal to the cause of Rome. And so they would send out spies into the Christian gatherings. They would send out spies when the Christians meet, especially when they meet in secret. And so this year... It's an excerpt of that report given to us by Tertullian. And I will quote, of course, in English. I'll have that on the screen as well. Tertullian quotes, and they talk about the Christians no, during that time. These Christians are very strange people. They meet together in an empty room to worship. They do not have an image. They speak of one by the name of Jesus who is absent but whom they seem to be expecting at any time. Sounds familiar, right? And look at how it ended. And my, how they love him. And how they love one another. So it works, right? Amazing. Amazing proof that it really works. What a glorious report shared to all of us who may doubt if God can enable us to live lives like this. Another old manuscript uh, given to us as a free first-hand account of the testimony of these Christians, it is called the Epistle to Diognetus. The Epistle to Diognetus. I'm not introducing a new scripture, okay? Um, I believe that these manuscripts are very important to us. Historical documents giving us proof of how Christians lived during that century, during that difficult period. Nag-work ba yung advice ni Peter sa kanila? And what does that report say? The report says that Christians love what? All men. But all men persecute them. They are totally, uh, they live in poverty, but enrich many. They are totally destitute. What does destitute mean? You have no resources. You're, you're very impoverished. But possess what? An abundance of everything. They suffer dishonor, but that is their glory. They are defamed, but vindicated. What else? And so this is what baffled them. How the Christians are when it comes to their enemies. They really love their enemies. This is what they do. A blessing is their answer to abuse, deference, or that's another word for submission. That's their response to insult. For the good that they do, they receive the punishment of malefactors. But even then, they rejoice as though receiving the gift of life. Christians... Love those who hate them. Grabe. These Christians were viewed as a strange kind of people. But their shining example of virtue resonates even now. And it has radically changed 
the world around them. You know, as I was reading this, napapayak ako kasi I could picture the things that they have experienced. No, I wouldn't want to live in that kind of an era. No, being thrown into the den of lions, being used as as uh, lighting poles along the way, crucified. Would you want to experience that? I wouldn't want that to happen. I wouldn't want to live in those days, but I praise God and I thank the Lord that these people stood firm in their faith because of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord because of persevering saints. We do not have a record of each and every one of their specific names, but I praise the Lord that because they stood for what the apostles and what Jesus Christ has taught, their lives had a lasting impact to all Christians who are here, living here in this world today. Do you agree? Amen. So I believe, tayo as a modern day church, we can continue to grow in our love for our Lord Jesus Christ and our love for one another. I believe that as we pursue the good life that is mentioned here, that life can become a stunning, a shining testimony about the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. The good life is actually a different kind of life. That is why when Peter describes those believers, he called them what? He called them pilgrims. He called them sojourners. He called them foreigners. As if people who are in this world, but they don't belong in this world. That's also should be evident in all of us. Are we the same? I hope that we continue to love and care for each one here in this church. I pray that when each and every one of us encounter difficult people, wherever or whoever, whoever they may be, we will not what, return evil for evil, insult for insult, but instead give a blessing to them. Show them the reason why we are built different. Okay? I pray that our lives can reach out to more and more people around us, people in need of a refreshing and comforting new way of life and living, showing them how much we genuinely care because Jesus does care. Amen? And so I pray that as we remember these things and keep them close in our hearts, what are those things again? Cultivate the right attitudes. Cultivate the right attitude towards hostility and cultivate a hunger for God's blessing. Okay, so this coming Sunday, what's going to happen? You will all be celebrating one of the most joyous and one of the most anticipated (laughs) occasions that this church prepares for every one of us year after year. And since we are now almost in the post-pandemic era, we will have a chance to come together face-to-face. We didn't have this last year, right? We will be there in Fairmont to praise and glorify and thank the Lord for His wonderful gift. And so may our Christmas celebrations be filled with not just the, you know, the usual happiness, merriment, and gleefulness and fun that we as a church normally have, but may we involve ourselves in building up each other and every member of our spiritual community, even in that party that we will be having, no matter how small that event may seem to be, okay? God can turn that occasion into an avenue for all of us to display the attitudes that we have just learned here. I know this is but one event, but I'm sure we can use this time to encourage one another even that. Okay? So when you're there, show compassion and care to everyone as you transfer from Suntec all the way to Fairmont. Okay? It's going to be a long day. Okay? Be compassionate to the committee members. Okay, they who have been toiling for weeks and weeks now, show them your appreciation by participating in the program, okay, and then engaging the newcomers. So we've invited a lot of newcomers, right? Involve yourselves with them, okay? Those first timers, inquire about their lives, ask them how they are, be tender hearted amongst them, not just saying hi and hello to them, but being able to show what true concern and also probably genuinely praying for each one of them. Be compassionate to the next person in the buffet line, okay? It's buffet. Magtira naman kayo. Huh? Buffet, what does buffet mean? Buffet means you can come back for more. It's not all, at, uh, all you can eat at one time. 
Okay? Buffet is not like that. Okay? I know this event is just a small sampling of what we can do outside, but the application begins as soon as we leave this place and we walk out of those doors. Amen? So please do remember that. And joking aside, may all these things that we have learned today be the hallmark in our D groups, in our families, in our fellowships, in our ministries, our GLC classes, our meetings, and of course, in every church-wide event that we will all be into, especially as we move forward to the next year. Do you want to have a good life? Amen? Do you want to have a blessed and joyful life? Amen. Someone said, true joy in life is this. Joy is putting Jesus first, others second, and then last is yourself. That's true joy. So may all our lives be a testimony of God's loving kindness to us all. And may we all grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. And all of us say, Amen and Amen.